Good morning, Valley Church. Let me invite you to open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. Today we're going to be looking at verses 13 to 22. As you're turning there, I want to extend an invitation for you to join me for my Wednesday wanderings. Wednesday at lunchtime, 12 to 1. Uh, I'm having a Zoom meeting. I'd love to have you join. Questions, answers, everything in between. Sharing uh, hopes, fears, dreams, our lives together. So uh, I invite you to come uh, to that. You can just email info at valleychurch.org and uh, we'll send you the link on that. So we're loving this series that we're in called Poised Together, our journey through First Peter. We're uh, halfway through our book just about. And so we're looking into these, these lessons for living, in particular, lessons for living in a hostile environment. And my title this morning is No Fear. And uh, that's probably a familiar phrase to a lot of you because you know the clothing brand, No Fear. Um, that, that was started by a guy named Marty Motes. And he's a legend in the motocross world. He scored a historic victory as one of the first Americans to ever win the U.S. Grand Prix of motocross. Now, if you think about it, for most people, myself included, Riding a motorcycle around a, a small track with, uh, at high speeds, crowded with other riders, with obstacles and turns and jumps soaring into the air, would cause fear for most people. I think that's a pretty uh, safe statement to say. But not for him. He was considered by some to be the most skilled American motocross rider of all time. And again, he leveraged that fame that he had, he started this clothing uh, line called No Fear, and you've probably seen either the brand or you've seen the bumper sticker. Unfortunately, as fearless as Mr. Motes was, he had his own private fears, his own private um, uh, struggles. And as, as fearless as he was on the racetrack, unfortunately, Mr. Motes died at the age of 49 from self-inflicted gunshot wounds. We all have our own fears. We all have those things that cause us fear, anxiety, and trepidation. You see, the truth of the matter is that every human being is a, is a little bit insecure, a little bit guilty, and I think a little bit afraid if we would be honest about it. The dictionary definition of fear is an unpleasant, often strong emotion caused by anticipation or awareness of danger. It's an anxious concern. Synonyms are dread, fright, alarm, panic, terror, trepidation. But the reality is that like pain, fear is a gift from God. It allows us to know something is wrong. And fear in particular prepares us for fight or flight in case of danger. The heart rate increases, the lungs dilate to allow more airflow, goosebumps rise up over the skin, the digestive system shuts down, pupils dilate, saliva decreases, and there's a secretion of sweat, especially on the palms. I can witness to all of those things happen, the first, happening the first time I asked Valerie out. Oh, I was nervous. I was afraid. Would she say no? Would she say, get lost? Would, you know, what, what was going to happen? I didn't know. It uh, appeared to be uh, anticipation or awareness of danger. Now, kidding aside, we live in an increasingly hostile and threatening world. I just read this morning, it start, starting March 16th, starting with the, 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 the gun slaying of, of eight people in Atlanta, Today, as of today, the U.S. has had 45 mass shootings. That's 45 mass shootings in just over 30 days. So what strikes fear into your heart? What is it that, 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 that dark moment where you're, you, those, all those emotions, all those physical things happen to you? The internet lists 60, 60 different kinds of phobias that start with the letter A. Some of you say anacrophobia, A, spiders. Yeah, that's it, that, that does it. That, just the word sends you into that fight or flight response. 
But there are serious things that cause fear among us today. And let me walk carefully but deliberately. I think a lot of what is tearing our country and our churches apart right now is fear. Last Sunday, we talked about how we can live and, and, and work and minister together. In chapter 3, verse 8, Peter says, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Why is it that we don't do that? I think what keeps us from doing that is fear. You see, on the one hand, people are afraid, for instance, of catching COVID and passing it along to a loved one. On the other hand, we've got people who are afraid of losing their rights. We've got people who are afraid to get the vaccine. We've got people who are afraid of people who haven't gotten the vaccine. I'm grieved to say I recently heard of a church in the Central Valley that is splitting over the issue of masking. And this is a complex situation. Uh, on our own board and staff, we, we have varying opinions and, and we're glad that the Supreme Court of the United States has given the green light for us to reopen indoor worship services. And so we're prayerfully considering how do we listen to, how do we are sympathetic to those who are on various sides of this issue. Listen, you can argue about conspiracy theories all day long, but I tell you in no uncertain terms, it's a conspiracy from the pit of hell that wants to destroy the church, that wants to tear people apart, that wants to immobilize people, to separate people. We talked last week about the dissonance that happens, those clashing ideas, clashing words, clashing actions, and Satan is laughing. He's laughing at the church when that happens. And as we said, it gets complicated when those disagreements are over issues that are biblical, issues of justice, issues of truth, even issues of theology. We get worked up into righteous indignation. We think that God needs our help to defend the truth. Believe me, I've been there. I've done that to my shame. So here's the question then today. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid to lose? What are you afraid to get? For yourself. This is where it gets complicated now. For your kids. For your loved ones. For your country. For your world. I want you to take a second right now. And just think of at least one or two specifics. A specific thing that, that causes you fear. Now it might take a little digging. Because what we're told is. Hey have no fear. Don't worry about it. Don't let them see you sweat. Don't, don't let anybody know what's going on in here. But just for a moment, in the quietness of your heart, in the quietness of your I just want you to say, you know, Lord, I'm going to admit, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm afraid. I'm afraid of the world we live in. I have fear over the loss of, and then fill in the blank. I'm a fear of getting and fill in the blank. And the good news today is that the gospel and the person of Jesus Christ alive in your life has an antidote for the virus of fear, for the immobilizer of fear, for the divider of fear. So let's see what, what Peter has to say here in this, in this beautiful little text. He says this, verse 13, Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? I've got three big ideas today, and the first one is that we don't have to fear. There is no fear. The general idea that Peter is giving here is live honest lives and you won't be in trouble. Kind of, you know, pay your debts, live with integrity, eat right, uh, and, uh, and you'll do okay. Remember Psalm 34, uh, quoted back there uh, uh, just in our previous text in, in verse uh, 10? Who desires to love life and to see good days? And we all do. Everybody wants that. So, so, so the, the pragmatic thing that Peter is saying here is that live a life of, of integrity, of, of, of character, and you'll do good. Now, is Peter saying, hey, listen, the world's a beautiful place and nothing bad will ever happen. You know, kind of close your eyes, don't watch the news, don't do any of that, and, and everything will be fine. 
No, he's not. Verse 14 says, but even if, right? It's a, it's a rare word meaning unlikely but possible. In fact, we, we've already seen uh, from earlier chapters in this, in this letter that, that Peter is, uh, is, is telling them it's happening. It is happening to you. There is an evil, insulting, and threatening, and slanderous culture. It's hostile to Christians. Look over to chapter 4, verse 12. He says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial that comes upon to test you as though something strange was, uh, was happening to you. Right? He, he says, it, it's going to happen. It's happening around you, and you shouldn't be surprised. That there is this, this anticipation or there's this expectation, hey, everything's going to go smoothly for me. That's, that's my right. And, and what, what he's saying here is, no, it, it's not your right. In fact, the scripture says, you know, pretty clearly that the day is going to turn so evil that people will engage in these practices of the Gentiles, the carousings and drinking and drinking parties and say, hey, why aren't you doing it too? So it's not going to be enough just not to do it, but they're going to tell you, you need to be involved as well. Civil governments are supposed to punish evil, reward good, but they don't always. Sometimes they're unjust. We, you'll have unreasonable employers, particularly ones who will, who will punish you, penalize you for your stance for Christ. You won't advance because you, you, you live a life committed to godly principles. You will suffer uh, socially, uh, economically, because of your commitment to Christ. We've already talked about disobedience or unloving spouses that some will live within. No, it, it's, not, it's not that it probably won't happen, but it will happen, but it doesn't compare to what we have in resources for us. So I believe Peter gives us five um, ways to live in the reality of tension and strife and conflict and yet not be paralyzed by fear. Look at the first one. We find it in verse 14a. It says, but even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, be blessed. Now again, this is a familiar theme. We saw it last week. We saw that that when we suffer for the cause of doing good, we're blessed, and, and, and in several ways. One, we learn from chapter 1 of 1 Peter, verse 7, that our faith is being tested, it's being refined, that we learn the, more about God and more about ourselves in the midst of these testings. I think he, 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 re, he, he drops this so easily to say you're blessed, because we already have this rich context of the inheritance of the saints. We have this living hope based in the person and work of Jesus Christ. We, we know about the salvation and inheritance that Peter has talked about earlier. So he says there's all these blessings we've already talked about. And, and of course, that will be rewarded in the life to come. That we can trust in a God who judges rightly. In that final day, even though we can't see it completely now, but we can trust in that. You'll be blessed in those times and places. The second thing he says is don't panic. We see this in verse 15. Uh, and do not fear uh, their, their intrepidation, uh, intimidation. I'm sorry. And do not be troubled. And do not be troubled. Um, but in your... Yeah, sorry, that's 14b. Uh, have no fear of them, uh, ESV says, nor be troubled. So I'm fully convinced that one of Satan's most devastating tactics is to lead us to endless what-if questions. In fact, to an unhealthy level. Now again, we're not talking about a reasonable response to danger. Right? Peter, Peter did not want his, his people all to be martyred. You can't talk about Jesus if you're dead. Now, some would be, but what he wanted his people to do was to be blessed and to live. So I'm not talking about an unreasonable fear, but we're talking about that, de, uh, that, that um, uh, immobilizing kind of fear, that kind of anxiety that ties us up and doesn't allow us to think right. 
It leads us to those unhealthy questions that, that circle around in our brains, that race ahead, and that frees us up. Now, the reality is you and I cannot help the automatic responses of our body in those fearful situations. But what we're talking about now is what do we do next? How do we respond in those moments? Remember, I talked about fight or flight. Now, you may, you may think I've got to run. And, and beloved, the, the, the scripture do, does say there are times when we need to run. Young, young Timothy was told by his mentor Peter, he said, flee youthful lusts. But then he told the church in Ephesus, no, you need to stand and fight against the schemes of the devil. There are times to fight. Our tendency might be to flight when we need to fight and to stay in the midst of it when we need to actually remove ourselves in those situations. So what do we do? Do we run? Do we cave in? When we're bound up, when we're tempted to compromise, that's when we know we're not doing what he wants us to do here. Don't compromise. Don't cave in. Do we fear peer pressure to an inordinate level to where we're willing to say, I can't risk my place, my likes, my, my friends. Do we fear the loss of advancement? So much that will compromise our commitment to integrity, to honesty, to family? Do we fear the loss of our friends so that we'll compromise our commitment to clear guidelines of holy living? standards of purity. When facing economic challenges in the midst of our stand for Christ, will we become anxious or immobilized? Will we fight? Will we, will we go to flight? Or will we be immobilized by fright? No, Peter says that's, that's not God's way for you. You don't have to panic. So, no fear. You don't need to be controlled by fear. Second thing he says is that there's, that there's this whole side of it that says, now, 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 since you don't have to do that, don't be consumed with regret. You don't want to look back on your life and say, oh, I wish I'd thought of this. I wish I'd done that. No, he says, do these things before it's too late. And the third thing is, declare Jesus as Lord. Don't be afraid. Don't be intimidated but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. That word sanctify means to set apart, to, to reverence, to hallow, to acknowledge Christ as Lord. Remember the context, it's that of a wrong being, uh, a wrong being done to you as a result of you doing what's right. And you remember, I belong to Christ and he belongs to me. I'm going to take that stand because of what Christ has done to acknowledge Christ as Lord in the midst of an unfair, unjust event. How do we do that? Well, I think practically speaking, we just have to say, pray one and say, Lord, you see what's happening here. You know what's going on. You know what's, what's happening. And then not to respond with threats, but as we talked about last week then, with blessing. Listen, friends, you're going to be tempted to put up your dukes. You're going to be tempted to strike back, to protect yourself, and to hit back. Or in a place where you, you, you should stay, you'll be, you'll be tempted to run. What is the balance? Where is that in the middle of that? And this is why we've, we've put Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 33, 35, and 39 in here today. What? Because declaring Jesus as Lord means I've committed myself to him. But then the beauty of it is that he's committed himself to me. And Romans chapter 8 is a favorite of, of Christians throughout the centuries who are suffering, suffering for exactly this reason. And Paul, in that first century, knew that we would need this. <laughs> he needed it. And he asked this question in 31. For if God is for us, who can be against us? Again, this rhetorical question, just like Peter does. It, it, and the answer is, there are plenty of people who will come against us. There's plenty of people who will bring a charge. There's plenty of people who will try to do evil. But the idea of the rhetorical question is, they're nothing 
They're nothing compared to God. It's almost like, I mean, not in a callous or cavalier way. He says, well, bring it on. What does he go on to say? He says that who shall bring a charge against God's elected is God who justifies, rooted in the firm truth of the gospel. Verse 35, who will separate us from the love of Christ? I mean, th this is another sermon for another day that you've maybe already heard. But Paul goes through and lists all these things that could be tempting for us to think, well, this will do it. Here's the big one. Tribulation. Paul says, not a chance. Distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword. Hey, listen, the reality is every one of those things would, on their own would cause great fear in our hearts and minds. We'd be tempted to, 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 to cave in, to flee, to run, to compromise. And he says, no, none of those things can separate you. He goes on in verse 38, for I am sure that neither death nor life, ho hold on, wait a minute, death cannot separate us from the love of Christ? That's what it says here, friends, that death can't separate us from the love of Christ. That, 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 that the truth that we're talking about here is so powerful that the ultimate fear that most of us, I mean, again, naturally respond to cannot separate us from God. No, he says in all these things, we are hooper nikeo, more than conquerors. Why? Not on our own strength? No way. Based on him who loved us. No rulers, no powers, nothing present, nothing to come, nothing else in all creation can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I don't know about you, but that gives me a great amount of confidence. It gives me a moment to say, okay, here comes the fear. Here comes the darkness. Here comes the immobilization. But what do I do now? Now I go, wait a minute. Who could separate me? I'm Christ and Christ is mine. I've made Christ my Lord. And with that comes all the promises that God has for me in him. No, we can, we can have that great confidence and declare Jesus as Lord. The fourth thing that he mentions is, he says, be ready. Look at verse 15. Always being ready to make a witness, to make a defense for everyone who asks you to give an account of the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. There's that word hope again. That's the core of that verse. That's the hope. The sure foundation, that's the living hope from chapter one. That's all that we have in Christ waiting for us, present for us, available for us today. And, and, and again, you know, it, uh, Peter is describing witness in the midst of unjust suffering. In the unemployment line, because I got fired for being honest. When I'm overlooked for a promotion, because I'm, I'm not willing to compromise my faith. When I've been defriended because I've made a commitment to holy living and I won't participate along with them. So how do we do this? Well, Peter gives a couple of different uh, uh, ideas here. First of all, it, it's, it's a ready defense. It's right now. Don't miss a single opportunity. When somebody asks, and we all long for that time, ready for somebody to say, hey, why are you the way you are? I notice you keep your grass so green and neat. Well, that's probably not when it's going to happen. It's going to happen. You're going to be asked, how are you keeping going in the midst of this tragic trial? In the midst of this suffering you're going through, how are you enduring through this difficult time? No, it's a ready defense. And we should, friends, have a three-second version of our testimony, a 30-second version, and a three-minute version in the elevator, wherever we go. Uh, you know, some people don't like tracks, but just to have something that is ready to be able to tell your story. Secondly, it's, it's a reasonable defense. You know, it's not cockamamie made up. It's, it's personal. It's thought through. The word uh, account here comes from the word logos. It's, it's based in truth. It makes sense. It's appropriate. And it's contextual and it's personal. Third thing is it's gentle. You deliver it with wisdom and with love. I'm afraid too often Christians are known for, for being harsh and abrasive and judgmental. 
you know, screaming at people about going to hell as they walk down the street. You know, though Peter's uh, part here is to say, uh, present this with gentleness. Remember where you were. Remember your broken spirit, your brokenness, how much you needed God. Be humble. Uh, unfortunately, we have attitudes that don't allow people to hear about Jesus because all they see is us. But talk to them about this gentleness. And then, uh, just one more thing. It says, it's a, it's a respectful defense. The NASB uses the word with reverence. So that's, that's, that, that's how we respond in these moments. Now again, you know, you're thinking, wait a minute, I thought you were talking about when I'm afraid. Right. In that context of when you're afraid, how are you able to respond? Because you're thinking about the other person. So we're considering ourselves blessed. We're not panicking. We're declaring Jesus as Lord. We're going to be ready. And then the fifth thing is that we keep a clean conscience. And Peter is hammering away on this because he knows we can all blow it. He knows we can all step over the line. We can take matters into our own hands. Look at verse 16. And keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior what? Will be put to shame. They, they got nothing on you. They're not going to be able to trump up charges. They tried that with Jesus, didn't work. They're not going to be able to do it with you. For it is better, verse 17, if God should be willing it so, that you should suffer for doing what is right rather than for what is wrong. And again, we've talked about this several times. Being a good citizen, being a good neighbor, community member, submitting yourself to a government that may seem harsh or unjust. Listen, it's been hard the last 14 months to follow Santa Clara County guidelines. We have the most strict guidelines in the country. I, I'm not making that up. That's true. It's been hard. But we've made a commitment to do that. Why? Because, because of this, these verses. We don't want to have any slander against us. It means submitting ourselves to an unreasonable and unjust employer. Because You've said you'd do the job, and you're a person of your, of your, of your word, that your word is your bond, and you, you will hold to that. It means submitting to an unreasonable husband or sacrificing for a disrespecting wife because you understand God's plan for the family, and you long to preserve and bring peace. You long to see the blessings of God in your family, and so you will suffer. It's giving time and money and energy to people who you'll get nothing in return for because, because you love them in Jesus' name, the poor, the widow, and the orphan. So, no regret. Now, the third element I have here is that there's no excuse. And verse 18 and following is one of the clearest and most compact presentations of the gospel but I'll be honest, it's easy to drift off into controversial issues and lose sight of the much bigger picture. These verses are not about exact location of Jesus between the crucifixion and the resurrection. These are not about the nuances of baptism. Now, those aren't unimportant, but they aren't the main point. Just like us, Jesus was righteous and suffered for the good of other people. Look at verse 18. For Christ. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust. So crucifixion is part of the reason we have no excuse. Christ was crucified on our behalf. This is the underlying principle, doing good and getting evil in return. So that he might bring us to God. Isn't that beautiful? He brings it right back to the heart of the gospel. Right back to the person of, and work of Jesus. Having been put to death in the flesh but made alive to the spirit. Central to the gospel is that Jesus lived a sinless life and died on the cross for you and for me. But then secondly we see a proclamation of this truth. Verse 19 in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Now again, there have been 
books written, controversies written on this. I, I love what Martin Luther says. He says, um, I don't know for certain just exactly what Peter means. So <laughs> that's okay. Um, let me give you three main ideas that, 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 uh, that the church has come up with over the centuries. One is that a disembodied Jesus literally went to hell, went to the place of the dead, and he shared the gospel with fallen angels and with those who had died before the flood. It, it, it's more of a literal translation. It's more of a literal idea. We'll see this uh, concept back again in chapter 4 when we come there. But that's one idea. The second is that Peter is describing the pre-existing Christ in the person of Noah. As Noah uh, uh, talked about righteousness, as he, as he was a type, uh, that, that, uh, that Peter is saying, you know, just like Noah did, Peter was there, uh, uh, Jesus was there, and, and Christ was in Noah describing how to be saved from the flood. And that he preached to those who were in the prisons of their own sins. The third idea is that Peter is describing the triumphal procession after his resurrection in the spirit world as he ascended to the right hand of God. This proclamation, Jesus has won. And, and, and exactly who all the people are and, and all those things. We, buy me a big cup of coffee and, and, and we'll have a, a talk about some of the nuances of that. The big point here, again is that Jesus was righteous. He suffered for doing things for the good of others so we too can have victory because we are, uh, we are in Christ. We have that same promise, the same power, the same spirit that Jesus had to raise him from the dead. And the ark, uh, as we see here in verse 20, uh, that, that boat that Noah constructed is a symbol of deliverance from, from, from being saved. And the same way we've been saved from our sin. So, so Peter is saying, keep focus on the right thing. That idea of the vindication of Jesus and the vindication for us. And then the third element we see here is the resurrection to that. And, and baptism in the context of that. Verse 21, corresponding to that, that, that idea of the boat taking those eight and, and rescuing them, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Again, Christ raised from the dead, and so you can raise from the dead too. Now, if you just read this verse, you might say, okay, all I have to do is jump in the baptistry and I'm good to go. And, and that's not what Peter is saying here. There is just a general understanding that if you're a believer, if you put your faith in Christ, then you're baptized. The New Testament is clear. Every time someone comes to faith in Christ, they get baptized. And, and friends, if you have not taken that step of obedience and faith, the, the number one thing that people tell me when they say, why haven't you been baptized, is this. Guess what? F-E-A-R. Fear. I'm afraid. I'm afraid of standing in front of people. Well, we've already learned that there is no fear, right? I'm proclaiming, I'm aligning, I'm sanctifying Christ as Lord. So no, inward transformation takes place first. Make sure you get the order right there. And the outward act of baptism simply tells, it proclaims to everyone who you are, who you're aligned with. Dipping into water won't cleanse people of their sin. And, and, and I love baptism because it talks about that, and we even say this sometimes, buried in the likeness of his death. And I hold people down a little bit, you know, just to get the idea. No, I, I won't hold you down longer than you need. <laughs> uh, but, but then, and raised in the likeness of his resurrection, right? That newness of life that we have. That's what he's talking about. Yes, and then finally, exaltation. Look at verse 22. Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven, after angels and authorities and powers have been subjected to him. A couple weeks ago, we talked about uh, the ascension of Jesus at the Joel moment. And, and that importance of that as understanding Christ as having ascended, of having the power and authority and majesty and he sat down at the right hand of, uh, of God the Father, right? But one day he will stand up again and he will come. 
And we're in that in-between moment where Christ has won the victory. But here on earth, we're still working his kingdom. We're still left here to bring the gospel, to tell others about Christ. And so we say, no excuse. Well, every resource is available for us. Every promise has been given for us not to be afraid. So let me ask you now to go back and to look over their list of fears. What excuses are you making for your fears? What, what little mental gymnastics are you going through? Oh, I'm just being a good parent. Uh, oh, I, I, I'm just being responsible with my finances that are keeping you from living a life of faith. That are keeping you from living the way God wants you to live. What excuses are you making for your fears? And what regrets will you have at the end of your life? I wish I had been more trusting of Jesus. I'd like to encourage you to make just a practical application, to make a commitment to a practical application. Will you share your gospel story with one person this week? Uh, Christian or non-Christian, I don't even care. But you'll get good if you practice it. And you'll probably go too long when you start. But that's okay. Just say, here's who I am in Christ. If somebody were to come up to you today and say, hey, tell me, why are you a Christian? Would you say, well, I've been going to church my whole life. Oh, I don't have anything better to do on Sunday morning. You know, no. You're going to talk about why you're committed to Christ. It'll strengthen your own faith, and it might plant a seed and strengthen somebody else's. A close of this story, William Borden uh, graduated from a high school and it's six, uh, in Chicago. And at 16 years old, his parents sent him on a trip around the world. He was heir to the Borden Dairy Estate. You've probably seen the little evaporated milk, Borden Dairy, still around today. And he was already a millionaire. As a young man, he traveled through Asia, and Middle East, and Europe. And as he did, he felt this growing burden as he saw suffering people. He saw starvation, he saw darkness, he saw conflict, and he wanted to do something. He wrote home in a letter and he said, I've got a desire to be a missionary. One friend expressed a surprise that he was, quote, throwing himself away as a missionary, unquote. And knowing that he had turned his back on his family business, and shortly after he renounced his entire fortune in favor of missions, he wrote two words in the back of his Bible. No reserves. Well, he went on to graduate from Yale, turned down high jobs. He finished his seminary studies at Princeton, and he sailed for China. And while he was hoping to work with Muslims, he stopped in Egypt to learn Arabic, and he contracted spinal meningitis, the deadly disease of his day. But in his Bible, he wrote two more words, no retreats. At the age of 25, within a month later, William Borden had passed away. The news of his death was cabled back to the U.S. and was carried in every major American newspaper. Borden's Bible was found and was given to his parents. And shortly before his death, William Borden had written two more words in his Bible, underneath the words, no reserves, no retreats, he'd written no regrets. Yeah, that's the kind of life I want to live. I believe that's the kind of life you want to live. And in Jesus, we have the power to live free from the burden, from the prison, from the immobilization of fear. Would you pray with me? Lord, I realize today even as we're sitting here, we're listening to this in our homes and, and on our phones, and some of us are deeply, deeply afraid. We have fears that maybe we're afraid to even speak because we feel like it's a dark hole we can't do in, go in. But Jesus, you're in the hole with us. You're in the prison with us, and you're pointing a way of life, of freedom, some of us are bound up by regret, by, by things we'd said and done we wish we hadn't, Lord, and, and you long to take us out of that prison as well. So in Jesus' name and in the 
hooper nikao in the overwhelming victory that's ours in Christ because of the death, burial, and resurrection. God, we proclaim we long to be free. Free from fear. Free to live. Free to give. Free to talk about you for your glory. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.